Good morning. It is Wake Up to Business, your Get the Business Day Started program. It's business news, plus also business strategy, such as you want to prove your environmental credentials as a firm, but you're currently based in a big concrete block. We may have a way you might be able to sort that out. If you're looking to base your business in London but have no idea about where to live, we might be able to help too. And if you plan on setting up the next Facebook or your business is based online, do you really need legal advice? Wake Up To Business is your Get The Business Day Started program, coming from the country's top business shows, expos and networking events. Join us as we discuss today's business news, strategy and gain some tips from our panellists that might help you in your business today. Good morning. Here's a quote for you. You're only given one little spark of madness. You mustn't lose it. The words of the comedian Robin Williams, who of course we all lost this week. He might have been talking about comedy, but it certainly applies to anyone who's ever taken the leap into business. I hope your little spark of madness is at full tilt today, whether you head a large or a small company. So this is Wake Up The Business TV, coming directly from the country's top networking events, expos and business shows. We're all about promoting these events. And if you're listening on iTunes, then the sound behind me right now is the Hounslow Chamber of Commerce event at the big yellow self-storage building, which you cannot miss because of its brightly coloured building on the Great West Road, heading out of London in Brentford, West London. Which is, uh, of course, this area is an economic powerhouse of the city. We've got B Sky B, the news organisation where I work for a bit in the past, BP and Glaxo Smith Klein as well. There's sort of been around 1,500 businesses starting each year here, with around 78% serving the local economy. We've got a couple of people who definitely do that on my panel here today. You can find out all the details, of course, on this event at hounslowchamber.org.uk. As always, the organisers have put forward three fascinating guests to represent the kind of people you can meet at their events. Don't forget, if you want to talk to any of these people afterwards, just come along to the Hounslow Chamber of Commerce next time or check out our website for their details as well. We've got John, who is uh, well, a green roofs company, I suppose, is one way of describing it. Um, You've just been listed also in what the top six shortlist for the greenest business, something like that? Yeah, it was the National Green Business Awards, and we got shortlisted um, out of 250 companies into the top six. Fantastic. So it's all going very well in the, in the green sector at the moment. Yeah. Wonderful. So we'll find out more about John in a bit. Craig, also, you're an estate agent. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you've just sold your first million pound property. Well, it was a couple of weeks ago. It was the first one in, uh, well, it's actually Eisenhower, for the Brentwood Borders. So it took all this recent surge of our prices. But it's uh, an indication of how much this area is actually on the yacht family. It's no longer quite the poor relative. Which is I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Just arriving here tonight, you're surrounded by all these huge office blocks. So there's, there's plenty of money coming into this area. So it's not surprising, is it? It is. It's a very influential area for the Brentwood. For many at a time, it was uh, an industrial area. Yeah. So the properties are really, really on the rise now. Now it's certainly changing. And Lloyd, finally, uh, you're from a law firm. You know, I think we're going to have plenty to talk about in terms of business today. But you've also just, your company has just created a specialist internet division as well, hasn't it? Uh, well, it's a business development uh, division, Richard. Yes, we've, uh, we're presenting to the Law Society on this in, uh, in November. The partners uh, had an idea to uh, throw open and create a business development team from inside the ranks right. to report on business development strategy uh, yeah. as opposed to you know, outsourcing that and seeing what the people who work for the business felt about it and examining their views. And it's something that's, that's it's, really worked It's for us. such a relevant thing with technology, Charlie. Absolutely, yeah. Also relevant to me as well because my name's Richard Medson from a social media company, shoutpow.com too. So let's start off with what's going on in the business world today that could be relevant to you with a bit of news. One from actually a couple of weeks ago, first of all, which we haven't managed to fit in, is about customers who are slow to pay. According to thisismoney.co.uk, small businesses are owed billions of pounds in late payment. But new research has shown that a third are reluctant to chase slow-paying customers because they're worried about upsetting them or feel embarrassed. Indeed, more than a third, 34%, say they write off thousands of pounds of bad debt every year. From a legal point of view, people should be chasing them, shouldn't they? Well, absolutely, and it's it's kind of the uh, the business world reflects, I guess, what people would levy at the British public, which is we've got this kind of... Uh, Sorry, old chap, to bother you, but you you know you owe me thousands of pounds. Um, a key key development in this area, Richard, was last year uh, there was uh, a new 
rule passed where the small claims threshold for business debt recovery jumped from 5,000 to 10,000. Yeah. The effect of that is that if you use lawyers to chase down your, your bad debts or potential bad debt, should we say, you now can't recover your legal fees. So £9,000 to your business, to my business, to John's business and to Craig's business, that's an awful lot of money. Yes. Um, uh, and you know, have you got the time as business owners to chase that down yourself via a lengthy court process? I, you know, perhaps not. So, but paying your lawyers, that's money that comes out of the debt if you recover it. So it really is a problem. So that's actually made the situation worse. I think so. I think so. Moving on to the next story. If you're a retailer and uh, wanting to set up a new branch, then a new app is being developed in the United States, which could make life easier. It's called Pinpoint and brings all the local demographic data together, as well as footfall data as well, to allow you to assess the local potential market just by picking a spot on the map. It sounds too easy to be true, doesn't it? It's still just US-based at the moment, but let's hope it comes across here, or perhaps you'd like to develop it yourself. Craig, this could be useful for you. Oh yeah, very If you were developing so. a new branch. But very much, I mean, a lot of our stuff now is internet-based, but we still do depend on a shop window. Mm. People will come out at a lunchtime on a Sunday afternoon, and we trust people will look at the state agent's windows. It's sort of a national pastime with us. So we could fix a point where it has the greatest amount of footfall in a particular area. Because like, the traditional way of doing it is you walk down the high street and have a look, don't you? Yeah, but if they can actually give you some hard statistics, yeah. that's going to make life easier. Very much so, yes. Yeah. And as I say, people still like to walk around the state agent's window. So yeah, 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 I want to ask you about that, the, the, the personal touch as well. Mm. Also, if you've ever tried to employ staff, have you ever noticed a problem? It seems that youngsters are training for the wrong jobs these days, and so so many will have little to offer us as businesses. A report just out from the centre-left think tank, the Institute for Public Policy Research, gives an example saying 94,000 people are training for beauty and hair jobs for just 18,000 jobs. Meanwhile, another recent report said three quarters of the British business believe a significant skills crisis will hit the UK within the next three years. John, we were talking about this earlier. You're saying this is a problem for you. Definitely. Being in the construction industry, and we're a rapidly growing business, we need people to take on board their work without training. We need to take on experienced people mm. who are already trained. And at the moment, with this growing and expanding, we haven't got that pool of people. But what, what's the problem? I mean, let's throw this on to all of us. Mm. What is the problem? Is it that the schools aren't teaching them the right skills? Is it that the kids aren't interested in learning about our businesses? What do you think the problem is? Let's start with you, John. Well, the market is saturated two or three years ago, whereas now you don't have those people coming through. You don't have people in apprenticeships. You don't have people who are coming through wanting to be in the construction industry. So. When we are putting adverts out and recruitment campaigns out, we're not getting the people in to fill those posts. So it's a lack of inspiration about the, the career? I think it's a saying? lack of inspiration. I think there's enough of courses available. Yeah. A lot of things are very dated. Whereas now, as construction moves on, it's very specialist. And that's not what people are getting. Yeah. You're getting very broad and very general views. However, we need more specialist training so people can go off and branch off into those careers. Is that relevant to you, Greg, to you, Lloyd? But lack of skills, is that? Well, if I, 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 just, just from my perspective, mm. uh, the, uh, it's a bit of a closeted world. The, le the, the legal recruitment industry um, is hugely oversubscribed from Red Brick Unis, yeah. Oxbridge. That we, you know, we've got the numbers coming in, we just don't you know, necessarily have, have the roles to fill. So we're looking at that from, I guess, the other end of that. So it's, the, it's too mm. much to do. Yes. Are you really? finding people who are ready to be estate agents? At the, at the starting level, yeah, but that's not a problem. But as you said, it's for people with further experience and managerial experience is what we have trouble with. Um, my wife recently tried to employ someone in her high end showroom and uh, married them. And they, uh, the sort of uh, people coming in for the interviews seem to like were unable to dress themselves or present themselves in public, which is a huge. I noticed you've got a tie on, and um, we haven't. So <laughs> we need to smile. Still, it is evening. Are we allowed off? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's a generational thing. I think mm. younger people have got a very much more lax and fairy attitude. And not that it's right or wrong, but I do think people coming through have got a, a different attitude to people that are more established. I'm not saying either is right or wrong, but I think there's a, a clear divide on what expectations and perceptions. I, I'm interested though, you're, you're in a green business, which I would have thought would be really popular with young people these days. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not just a sort of, you know, ranting, running outside Westminster, 
waving banners. This is a, a proactive, useful way of using environmental attitude. It is, but the educational process doesn't push people down those avenues. Yeah. The, the options available are things like carpentry, uh, brickies, those kind of traditional subcontract employers. But what we need is not available. Yeah. You don't get people trained up to provide what we need. So Yeah, the problem is clearly there, isn't it? Yeah. If you've got a new story, do let us know. Also on the forum on wakeuptobusiness.com. So let's talk to our guests about their specialist knowledge now and get some advice with the uh, first question being, you want to prove your environmental credentials. This is obviously John here as a firm, but you're currently based in a big concrete block. So have we got a way that we might be able to help you out with this one? John, just tell us a bit about what you do, first of all. I, I've, you know, I've seen it, but just tell everyone. Basically, we're, we're a one-stop shop. If you have a flat room, we can introduce anything to your roof, from a recreational area to an environmental area. We can install uh, beehives, we can do herb gardens, living walls. If you've got an area, we can install something. Right. However small or large, it can have an impact, but it's educating people to know that you can actually portray that in a flat roof or a walled concrete area. So obviously it's a nice idea, is it? Does it make business sense? Yeah. If you've got employees, it's good for them to have a recreational area. If you're in a built-up area where at lunch times and break times they can't go somewhere, then there's somewhere you can explore. And if you've got a new build with a flat roof, by introducing a roof garden, you can double the life expectancy of a roof. So therefore, immediately, you've got a financial benefit. But I think people overlook that because the initial cost may be high, but the long-term benefits and the long-term cost could be influential. It could be something different. So, I mean, this is something that well, you can relate to in terms of the value of property. And oh, very much so, yes. Um, property is now the one major asset the majority of people in this country have. Uh, it's inherited so personally owned. So anything that can improve the lifetime of the quality of product so, I mean, if you were sort of saying to John, in, in terms of, I mean, you're mainly based on residential properties, aren't you? But it's it's how important is that that perception of the green thing and, and doing these sorts of things? It's coming in slowly but surely. I mean, we're not Scandinavian levels yet, but slowly and surely, more people are looking at that and then sort of the improvements they're doing to their properties. Um, I think we've still got several years to go before we get to a substantial level. So it's in, bi in business, there's a demand for this environment. Yeah. And the difference is with Europe is there's a lot of legislation yeah. where if you have a flat roof, you have to make it social or environmental. Whereas in the UK, you don't have that. It's, it's down to the, the owner of the building, their choice. If they want to increase their capacity on the roof space, they will do it. Whereas in Europe, they have to. And that, that is a fundamental difference, I think. Do you want any questions on that? You look uh, like you're about to. No, I don't on, on, on the green issue, no. I mean, it's a fascinating uh, fascinating area, and, uh, and it's one that I'm sure every businessman wants to see grow and succeed. I mean, one, one question is, is the insulation factor. If you're growing grass on the roof, presumably that is a good insulator, is it? Definitely. If, um, if you have any form of green roof, not just grass, but um, seed and wildflower or a garden, yeah, it does increase the insulation of a building, but also in the summer, it cools it down because you haven't got the rays coming down onto the building. So you do have those factors, but people don't consider those when they're trying to build a building. It's, it's something you can add afterwards, so that sound about. Oh, definitely, you can retrofit yeah. which is not yeah. a problem. But the concern with that is you have to make sure the weight loadings are right, yeah. but you obviously have to pay to ensure... So it's better to do it from the start, isn't it? Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Right. So this is the kind of things that you can find out about at events like this. Remember, we are at um, uh, this uh, fantastic event for Hounslow Chamber of Commerce here in uh, Brentford in the west of London. Uh, in fact, as a result of doing networking, which is what we're all doing tonight here and all the people behind us, I managed to set up a couple of people this week, actually, after we made the last show. Someone I'd met and managed to line up with someone else, and it looks like they're going to do some business too. So... Networking is a very worthwhile thing to do without question. 
Uh, don't forget you can check out more details about the Hounslow Chamber of Commerce on their website. Just put in Hounslow, Hounslow Chamber of Commerce and you will get all the details. And if you want to invite us to come along and film at your event, very easy. Just go to wakeupthebusiness.com, click on the events link and then how to invite us. There's everything you need there about how to use this show to promote what you're doing as well. And we're not limited to where we go either in the country. So do let us know if you would like us to come along. Craig, there's a lot of people that want to move to London. They've, I'm sure, read the newspapers. They've heard about how terrifying prices are in London. Is it still possible to base yourself in the city if you're coming from somewhere else? Let, let's get you in a bit closer to the mic as well. It is, but prices over the past um, 12 months have risen very sharply in the uh, London area. I mean, central London and some of our more rich area neighbours of Chiswick and Ealing is almost prohibitive the cost there. So, for everybody who's still affordable place and obviously further out into the house itself, going into the ice of the world, it's bed for these sort of places, you can still afford property there. But, um, this area, there's so much goes on in the Brentford area itself, such much of the uh, media industry is based here with films and TV companies. And that's um, what's pushing out the price very much so, yes. And we've seen, I mean, we just had Johnny Depp last week shooting a movie in Brentford. It's, it's such a major hub here for the media world. And also, as you said, along the A4 itself, the Golden Mile, even though it's two and a half miles long, is a major draw for businesses, as you mentioned at the start of the mm. programme. There's so many companies based in this area that all recruit people with a high number. But if, if you're moving to, uh, let's, let's say, to this area, to Brentford, mm. what sort of price are you looking at for, let's say, you know, something for a family with two children, you're moving to the city? What's that sort of price range that you think you, you're yeah. looking between? You're looking at sort of, say, a three bedroom Bexworth Authority property now, they'll be touching 375, 400,000 on average. Um, two bedroom Victorian cottages starting, I mean, this is what's called the bathroom, starting around 500 a month. Um, there's one property just sold in rent for just over 2 million, so, I'm sorry, I think about three, over 3 million, so it's right up to yeah. Uh, and I mean, we all live in London, don't we? we yes, know about the yes, absolutely. I must admit, I look at the papers sometimes and I think it'd be nice to buy a Scottish castle and commute by plane or something like that, but the reality is we do have to live in London. But it's an issue for us, isn't it? I mean, I mean, when you were looking for somewhere to live, how did you approach it? Well, I live, I live in Bedfordshire, my community. Right. Oh, well, there we go. Right. And the prices where I live, the very nice properties are very different to what you can achieve in London. Yeah. Is vast difference, but for myself, it's cheaper for me to commute in on a daily basis than live in London. Yeah. Well, listen, it's my 33rd birthday in a couple of weeks, and my mum keeps screaming at me, When are you going to buy? When are you going to buy? <laughs> I, you know, I, well, I live in Camden, Clapham. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it, 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 it just seems a little bit unrealistic at the moment to buy. I, I rent, so I, I'm perfectly happy with yeah. that situation at the moment. Who knows how I'm going to feel in another five, seven, eight years. I'll have to speak with Craig over another glass yeah, of wine. I'll have to. We could sort him out with something, can we? I'll put a word in somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're nearly done with part one of the show, although I'm really looking forward to this next topic as well, as it applies to everyone. If you plan on setting up a, the next Facebook, perhaps, or your business is based online, do you really need legal advice, or is it just all overhyped? If you've nearly finished your emails and you're about to uh, get on with the day, then don't forget you can listen in later on iTunes, on the train or in the car, on your way home, by just going to wakeupthebusiness.com and select listen on the menu. If you've got a few more minutes and all my guests are going to be going into a bit more detail about a business strategy question. But before all that, if you plan on setting up the next Facebook or, as, uh, as I say, a business online, do you really need legal advice? Our man on this one is definitely Lloyd to talk about this particular issue. Uh, I'm online. I've got a website. We've all got websites. Yes. Do we really need high-end legal advice? Is it high-end? Well, uh, so you've, 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 you've thrown the high-end uh, part into that question. You need good legal advice. Okay. Right. Um, I'm, look, the internet and, 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 and dot-com business in whatever format you're, you're, you're driving that forward or whatever works for your particular industry... A savvy commercial lawyer 
will help you achieve your objectives in the context of things that you don't have time to think about. Okay, the regulations that are that are on that, what kind of policies you need. Um, so, of course, I'm going to say yes. I'm, yeah. you know, it's my business interest to say yes. But you know, uh, do you remember in the '90s the Jurassic Park film when the guy was on that new venture into the unknown world and he sat around a table and he's saying, "Is this a good idea?" The only person that's on my side is the blood-sucking lawyer. Um, the blood-sucking lawyer will be on your side because it's within their interests yeah, to meet... Yeah, at least meet. we haven't got any dinosaurs. Well, exactly. well, you don't know, do you? Yeah, <laughs> dinosaur.com. But the, 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 the point is that commercial legal advice in what is still an unknown world is a very valuable commodity. Um, because if there's... you're setting up, if you're setting up some... Well, let's say in Craig's, Craig's situation, okay? You've got an estate agency online. Yeah. Is it really any danger? I mean, all you're doing is basically saying, I'm here, these are the kind of properties we've got available. No, I mean, on the, on the face of it, that, 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 that's not. But you've got to remember that you're visible to the, to the world at large. With every press release, publication, comment that your staff are making on your Twitter feed, which all, you know, that's all good business sense. And let's not get too, you know, angsty about this. People don't want dry uh, social media so, shots, do they? Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you do need to know what's going on judicially in that world, and it makes sense to consult with with, with a you know. It should almost be um, a, an outsourced part of your board if you're looking to get into. So is, is it really saying, look, this is what we want to do? What framework is sensible for us to work within a legal framework? Yeah, absolutely. Just to make sure we don't go and libel something. Ab- absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. libel is the is the one that sort of jumps off off the table, but obviously you've got. The regulatory um, matters, uh, you know, in terms of uh, buying from uh, certain service provider spaces, it's a complex world. It's, it, you know, I, I, I don't specialize in that. I'm a dispute resolution solicitor. Um, but as, as I say, you know, if you're thinking about moving your business into the online arena, and you know, I can't think of many businesses that wouldn't be wanting to do that now, um, you know, a consultation with a, you know, don't have to bring a, an in-house lawyer in as a, as a member of your, of your director's board, but, um, it, you know, it makes sense to know what are the rules within which we are playing here, and that can be done, you know, fairly quickly if it's, a, if it's an entrenched uh, and, and, and well-established business framework, such as, you know, a state agency online, there'll be precedents about uh, what regulatory cases have gone through, and how we should have to know. Them. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Craig, you know, it would be thinking... Commercially, how can I make money by moving in online? You know, he's not going to bother himself with the, with the ins and outs of, well, what are the EC saying about yeah. what I can and can't put by way of click to links to my T's and C's and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Let your lawyers worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. But I would so, say that, wouldn't I? Well, no, 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 that's fair enough. But I think, I think one of the big concerns of people going into business, particularly smaller businesses, they're going to say, well, look, a lawyer means just enormous amounts of money. Mm. So can they come to a firm and just get that one session for a reasonable amount? Now, okay, reasonable put it in quotes, your heart's content. Yeah. Can they do that? Or of course. Is it's the kind of thing that's going to lead into tens of thousands of pounds. Of course. Of, ab- of, of absolute course they can. The, gone are the days of picking up the phones with solicitor uh, before you can t- talk to someone who's actually, you know, the lawyer. Uh, you've got to enter into a retainer and then you're charged right. per minute. Uh, any practice that is operating like that is on its way out. You know, you speak to your commercial solicitors; they want to work with you. They want Great a long-term advice, relationship with you. So coming up, we've got a resource for you—a way to send out hundreds of emails or newsletters for free—and we'll be discussing business strategy in more depth too. So this is part two of Wake Up the Business: a chance to discuss things in a bit more depth over the next few minutes. Uh, we're at Hounslow Chamber of Commerce tonight at the big yellow self-storage building, in which you cannot miss because it's so bright. Brightly coloured. Did you much, didn't manage to miss it tonight? It's bright yellow as you'd expect. It really is. Um, so it's on the Great West Road, heading out of London in Brentford in West London today. And what a great event it is. Uh, before we get back to the really serious questions, uh, what's the best bit? Oh, here's a good question, actually. What's the best bit of advice you've ever received uh, when you were setting up your business? For me, uh, the thing I learned was uh, when I first got into business was it's not what you want to make or sell, it's what the client wants that matters. Your views really count for nothing if people don't want your product. I've got to ask all of you this. What, what, what's the best bit of advice you've ever had, John? To go with your instincts. Yeah? Sometimes really? that's the best thing to go with. If you doubt yourself, then you're going to question yourself. But if you've got your instincts, then go for it. Nine times out of ten, it's pretty much right. Yeah. So. 
Lloyd? Oh, the age old, ad, age old adage from my, the managing partner of my firm said, just don't let the highs get too high and the lows get too low. I know it's it, it's it's an old chestnut, but it applies personally and in business life, absolutely. Yeah. Craig? I'm very similar to you. It would go with your instincts. Sometimes make that snap decision because sometimes it is the right one which your heart springs tell you to go. Yeah, because you can sit there too long sometimes wondering about things, exactly. can't you? Just yeah. get on with it. Right, back to this serious stuff in a moment. I'll be putting the business strategy question to our panel. How do you deal with customers who are slow to pay without upsetting them? This is one we were talking about earlier. But first, Lloyd, um, we talked about online business. Yes. Uh, what are. We touched on this, but what would you say are the main potential threats to online companies today? So we're talking about estate agencies, we're talking about environmental policies. What are the threats? Where are they likely to come from? Well, I think um, what we call passing off. So uh, if you uh, have, I mean, a website is a very publicly accessible document, okay? So you can get it from naught to 100 miles an hour much quicker than historically opening up a shop front you know, in, in a town center. That carries with it the risk of doing something that someone else feels is impeging, impinging sorry, on, 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 on their IP, their intellectual property. Um, so that's a big risk. Uh, the other big risk is, of course, that any organization uh, that's more than one or a few employees has to be sort of homogeneously responsible for everything that everyone says yeah. on, on those sites. So would you, I would strongly encourage any any uh, business out there to have a, a proper social media policy yeah. and, and just get that message through from top end down to the down to the bottom end staff. What's our message? Are we on song with this? What are the licenses for each employee? What's the most common thing that people are taking legal action against firms about? What are some of those top things? Uh, are, you, are you referring specifically to, to sort of the online, online uh, yes, business? Yes, in terms of the online world. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would say that it, that it would be in the, in the passing off intellectual property breaches. So, you know, you, someone would, would invest in, a, in, in having a, a presentation or a webinar, some content on there that's specific to their business, and that's just being pulled off on a Google search, upsetting people. That's quite common out there, I think. So, uh, as I say, policy uh, that's carefully monitored by someone savvy who perhaps has consulted the commercial lawyer or their business partners, um, just with a little bit of, you know, a, a feel about So that's one of the most common things? Well, I would, I, I would suggest, uh, yes, yeah. if, you, if, if, if we're niching it into, yes. yeah, because yeah. essentially an online business is subject to the same rules, sure. tortious, contractual, and, and all so the rest of it. it's so easy online, yeah. isn't it? I mean, have you got much, well, I don't know, is there a lot of competition in your marketplace? There's not a lot of competition, but we use social media day in, day out. Mm. And then we're very aware that you have to be careful what you're putting out into the ether, because as soon as you've done it, there's a whole host of people that can see it. So I do think you have to think very carefully and think forward to make sure what you're putting on is so it's not going to offend, it's not going to cause upset, it's not going to breach uh, a legal aspect. Mm. So it is a minefield, mm. however it is something you have to do day to day to increase your profile. So yeah, yeah, you've got to do social media. Yeah. And, it's and of course the, the flip side is, as we said before in part one, no one wants bland, you know, yeah. watered down, like sort of party line um, tweets, they're mm. just, you know they're, they're, they're boring. Who it's wants to hear those? Passionate. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what about you, Craig? I mean, we, we we have a social media site, Twitter and Facebook. And so as every company, which we've been lucky, and most things are discussed in the office before we're actually put online. But our biggest one we have to be so careful for is the actual descriptions of property. Yeah. Because sometimes you can have people covering a great distance of your property, and if it's not living up to the expectations or there's things that are, are incorrect. You've got a lot to deal with, so we have to be very careful on that side. I mean, I've got a chap came recently from our details, came from France to see a property. Yeah. Is it a problem that people are becoming more unreasonable, or is it that businesses are taking too many liberties? I'm really throwing that one up in the air there. <laughs> I because it just made me wonder as, as we were talking about that. It's just like, well, if you're being honest and you're putting it on that you made a mistake, eh, it's a mistake. Shouldn't people just be going, well, look, these things happen? What's yeah, the well, problem? People rely on the information they're given. And I think people become very upset, whether it's online or otherwise. If you're given information and it's wrong, people immediately get their back up. So I think you have to look at it from two sides. From the business side, 
yes, people are overreacting. It's a simple human error. Yeah. But from a personal point of view, if you've made a special journey or you, yes. you've made a decision based on that information, yes, you're going to be upset. So yeah. I think it's very 50 50. I think it's. It's a double edged sword. Yeah. Can't win. It's always going to be people who are going to take legal action. That's and why you have a job. That no, means. well, absolutely. The, the, the other thing, of course, is that the pace of transactions using the internet has accelerated however many fold you want to ascribe to that process. So the natural checks and balances that, that would have been within a system of, from, say, purchase order for goods and services through to delivery, uh, that's now a million miles an hour as opposed to you know being part of a process. So, yeah. See, this is the kind of advice you can get, though, at an event like this. So we are talking about the issues, and Lloyd obviously got plenty of advice on that one. We're going to talk about the state agents again and, the, and the, the whole market in a second. Just want to mention, of course, don't forget um, Hanso Chamber of Commerce. You can find all the details on their website. So let's talk about, let's come back to this point, Craig, about um, estate agencies. It's a very fast-changing business sector because of the threat of the internet. You've also got different models of, of doing estate agencies. You've got the sort of almost pile high, sell cheap approaches. How do you compete in a, in a changing market? We keep a very strong brand profile in our particular area. We're not part of a large chain, we're a family run business and we're based in the heart of Brentford, before Brentford. So we sort of specialised, if you like, in our little niche. Uh, whereas a lot of companies, might be a chain where you know, they bring a guy in who doesn't know the area, doesn't know the property, so it's a bit blind. So that's how we've managed to retain our sort of company outlook on that. Uh, mm. Because, so it's I brand think, issue. Very much so, yeah. That's the only thing you can do. Yeah. I mean, that branding wrapped in with our reputation has been a, a, an honest... Because, I, I, I mean, I haven't been using the state agent for years, but you do go past some of these on the high street sometimes and you see them full of... Sounds very critical of this, but you see them full of people that look like they should be working in PC world. <laughs> um, they don't look very experienced, and they look like they're selling, selling fast and getting it done as quick as possible. And really, when you're when you're paying something for half a million quid, you know it's not a game. Not at all. Uh, and you know, quite a haste, repent at leisure. And, as I say, I mean, what we have a young chap who's 18, uh, who does it, his training, he takes people out and he's actually sold properties. And, you know, he is in fine with that. But as I say, the owner of the company is actually in the house anyway. So if anyone has any particular concerns about them, you can always approach her. And that's so you've got a nice brand, you've got a friendly brand, approachable brand, but can you compete with those other models, the sort of online internet estate agencies, the, the part high sell chips? There will. Some people will go for that style of selling to sell their property. Uh, and will be. other people will rely on a friendly local agent and um, you're not going to get all the business you never will do but we can take a respectable chunk of that to keep ourselves in so it's enough to keep you going very that want that personal service so it's a niche within the market very much but I do think as you said you've got one person there who you're training up with a larger chain you haven't got one person you're training you've got a whole host of people training up so the person you're training is getting the wealth of every single person in that business to get them up to speed. And I think as a consumer, that is much better than going to a chain who have probably got 10, 15, 20 people that are trying to train up and bring up to speed. So I, I think you've got it there. I think if, if you're going for customer service and, and someone who's going to take you personal, you're the route you need to take. Yeah, it's that strong brand, isn't it? Definitely. It's making yourself stand out, particularly yeah. in a, well, estate agencies, there's so many of them, aren't there? Oh, you've got to have a reason to actually be different. And the sad thing about about our industry, it isn't properly regulated. Ourselves, our members of various boards, uh, National Association of State Agents, for example, but any Tom, Dick and Harry can get a shop, set themselves up yeah. as a state agent with no ticks, no anything. And, and, and that's where Lloyd comes in. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's good to talk about that too. Um, so many different issues as you're hearing about here. Uh, coming up in a moment, uh, how to deal with customers who are slow to pay without upsetting them. But let's move on to, uh, to John again. Um, it kind of ties in with this one. Um, the environmental marketplace is something that people want to be associated with, isn't it? How can you use that to your, your business's benefit? I think people make a conscious decision. They either they're environmentally friendly or they're not. If you've got someone who's susceptible to it, then you can present ideas and you can present concepts which they may take up. If they're not, it's very difficult. Mm. If they're not that way inclined, 
all they're looking at is the bottom line or the monetary value. So you've got a very clear definition. But if you have got someone who is open to that concept, then you, you can run ID through them, you can really push it. But I suppose with environmental business, if you can walk into even the hardest no CEO, and you can say, look, if I put, I mean, I don't know your business, but I can put a green roof on your business and save you money, as long as you can give a really strong economic case, surely they're going to listen. Definitely, but you've got to get yourself in that position first of all. Yes. That's the challenge. It's not about what you can present when you're there. It's about getting the opportunity to present it. And that's the biggest challenge we have. Once you get there, yes, you can put all the, the whys and the what falls and the falls and the, and the benefits. But you've got to get there first of all. And how do you do that? Then? How do you get um, past the, the, the scepticism? Uh, persistence. Yes, um, which <laughs> that's is something a, we all do. Yeah. But also, it's persistent, but it's also legislation. You see, if someone's trying to get planning permission, they may get requirements to build X, Y, and Z to get planning permission. But it's also educating people that it's not just a green roof, it's what you can get with it. Mm. You see, the money you can save, the environmental you can give, it's uh, the social. Um, aspect, but so yes, yeah, educational. But that's a long process. That's not something you can achieve overnight. Are you finding you get a lot from referral business? Though? Is that something Definitely. that you rely on? Because then like, word of mouth is always. Majority of our business, being a new business, is referral. It's continued business that once you've done one project, you get it again and again. <laughs> Our hard work is educating people to get new business. Mm. I think, John, just 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 looking yeah. behind you, and there's a there's a there's a panel behind John's head here called Solar Energy. I'm not sure what the numbers mean, but uh, a part of the introduction to tonight was the mayor and a representative from the MP's office congratulating Big Yellow on 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 how yeah. economically, sorry, environmentally. And economically, I guess, as a runoff, um, uh, efficient this building actually is, yeah. and that's that's naturally feel good, isn't it? I mean, you know, you well, there they've got the figures, as you say. Absolutely, you walk in the door, yeah, yeah. you can see this. That's going to make me feel good yeah. as the con as the consumer. But you've got to have an individual or a team of people that will grasp that initially. Mm. If you haven't got that, a company's not going to go anywhere. Mm. You need people at the top who are going to understand the benefit of doing that to then filtrate throughout the company. If you don't have that, it's very difficult to talk to people at the lower end who are going to influence. Yes. But the big girl, I've got it to a T. Every single building they build have water harvesting, green roofs. They're very focused. But companies like that are very few and far between. That's not the norm. This is, this is very different to what most companies aim to achieve. Even on our side now, any property we sell or rent has to have an energy performance certificate. Renting yeah. it, that is how energy efficient yeah. it is. But people underestimate what a green roof can do. It's still, it's been about in the UK about 10 years, but with a green roof, with insulation, with warming, with the environmental aspect, people are uneducated and don't understand what that could bring to a property. Things like um, wall insulation or having a beehive are, are, are more common. But what we can do with a, a green roof is have got massive, massive benefits. But it's just an educational process. It's interesting, it's, it's that whole thing about actually getting their attention for a moment in order to explain yeah. what is happening. But again, back to what we said, social media and things will capture people's imagination. You need to be there at the forefront to keep talking to people and showing people what they can do. That's the only way to do it. What are you finding as younger people are... are you know, setting up in businesses and moving in a higher position, but it's getting, and, and the environmental issues have obviously been so much more prominent over the past few decades, that it's getting easier? Uh, to a certain extent. So Still tough, we, Yeah, because what we do is so new. So even the new people coming into the industry, it's still like a baby, it needs nurturing, it needs growing. Mm. So... I think with time it will come, but even with the new people coming into the industry, it, it's still not there. It's interesting stuff, isn't it? All these kinds of things you can find out at these events. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more to, to all of our guests in just a second, asking one final strategy question. Just to mention a couple of events going on around the country, just having a look at uh, some of those. If you're in the Midlands, and you're certainly well served in September. The first is the Venue Expo at Event City in Manchester on the 1st and 2nd of September. It's a free-to-attend business-to-business event aimed at people who organise events um, in the bu business, leisure and tourism sectors. 
so seminars and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're looking for venues, that big event going on there. Also Manchester on Friday the 26th of September 2014, there is the Midlands Business Expo at Edgbaston Cricket Ground between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And there's always a really nice buzz at the uh, Business Growth Show events. I've been to quite a few of those before. But lots of SMEs there as well. If you've heard about other events, do let us know all about them. And of course, if you'd like us to come along and film at a show at your event, then do get in contact with us via the website. Uh, right, our business resource is MailChimp this time. If you already do mailing lists or newsletters, then you probably know all about this. But if not, then the great thing about this online service is that you can start off for free. They have some amazing tools on there for building really attractive emails from templates. And the interface can be a little bit fiddly, uh, but the ability to send hundreds of emails for free really helps to get over that and uh, get you underway if you haven't done a mailing list campaign before. So have a look at that one. It is MailChimp, as in the chimpanzee. You're, you'll find it, just do a quick search on there. Um, right, just finally, I just wanted to ask, ask the three of you, This coming back to this issue we are talking about in the news, about late payments. Now, getting people to pay, I think, I'm sure all of us have experienced it. All of us have experienced it. How do we sort this out? I mean, you were talking about the, the legal aspect of it earlier. How do we put pressure on customers or how do we set our business models to make sure they pay? I would say in construction, if you've got a good relationship and you've done a good job and you invoice swiftly, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. If there's an issue with workmanship or late invoicing, then you are going to struggle. But I think if, as a company, from start to finish, you, you offer a good service and a good product, you don't have that issue. If you fall short of a contract, whether it's time or workmanship, you're going to struggle getting your money in. So but there's always going to be that customer that just kind of, oh yeah, I will do it, I'll, I'll remember to do it. You know, I've worked in construction probably seven, eight years. And when he's that, you've got that problematic customer, that's down to your own doing. I also think if you give fair trade for a fair job for a fair price, you get paid. Okay. And relationships optimize that. If yes. you've got a good relationship, you get good payment. If that falls down, that's when you have problems. That's a really good point. Develop a personal relationship. Definitely. Any other thoughts on that one? Well, usually for us, at home, the vast majority of our customers have paid. Once in a blue moon, there will be somebody, uh, and then we just hand it to yeah. our legal friends. I think it's really interesting um, and uh, and important to realise if you've delivered the service uh, and I and I completely endorse what John's just said here. If you've delivered the service and you're not getting your invoice paid straight away, you are extending a line of credit. Now, extending a line of credit. Uh, is a commodity in itself, isn't it? We pay Definitely. the banks to extend yeah. us credit yeah. as a service. Yeah. Um, and it's something that we, uh, particularly in Britain, we give away, you know. Um, so automatically 30 days, why don't you have seven? Yeah, seven days. I've done a great job for you. Uh, obviously, I don't expect the cheque to, to, to clear. We operate a seven-day policy. Well, there for you our go. suppliers, yeah. Yeah. regards their payment terms, if they've supplied the goods to our satisfaction, we pay them within seven days. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And it increases relationships, it increases credit limits, and I agree completely. If you've got a good relationship, why not honour that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Why no, wait so, 40, 45, 60 days? It just seems to be, if you talk to a, to, to a business owner, you know, the man on the Clapham Omnibus, right, he would say 30 days is the norm. Well, I think going forward as the business community, uh, Seven days should be the norm. But there's no excuses anymore. We're not no. writing checks and putting them in the no. post. No. This is all electronic transfers like that. Absolutely. If someone and gets honest, off their backside and does holding money between seven days and 14 or 30 days, yeah. interest you earn is minimal. Mm. Yeah. Surely relationships yes. <laughs> and building credit yeah. ratings is much more important than that few pence you can earn by holding your money. It doesn't make sense. It, yes. What can I say? It's been a brilliant conversation. Thank you very much to, to my guests tonight. Um, I'm sure you've got plenty to get on with today. We are filming this in the evening, so uh, I guess we're all pretty much just going home. That's it. I'm looking forward to a glass of red wine, actually. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think definitely glasses of red wine. Um, I hope you have a very successful business day today. I'm sure you'll have a busy one ahead. Before that, though, here's my social media tip of the day. Think about social media as a conversation, not as an advert. 
Just like people ignore banner adverts on websites, they also ignore tweets, which are just stuff with hashtags. So talk to your audience, engage with them, respect them, and then develop your prospects and your customers from that. I hope you got a lot out of today's program. Let us know if you use any ideas in the show, or equally if you have any suggestions on how we can make this show better to give you more value, because we're making this show for you. Go to wakeupthebusiness.com and put your thoughts on the forum there. If you have an event yourself or you want your event organiser to invite us, just go to the same place, click on the website, find out how we can come along to you as well. If you want to come and have a chat with these lovely people, Hounslow Chamber of Commerce, this is where you will find them. Um, it's going on regularly, they've got all sorts of events, you'll find all the details on their website. Uh, if you've still got a bit more time before you start your business day, then uh, if you need a virtual PA, then we spoke to one in the last show, so find out about that on our website if you want to find out what they get up to. You've been watching the Wake Up The Business TV, sponsored by shoutpal.com from Hounslow Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to thank all my guests, Lloyd, thank you. Craig, and John, it's been an absolutely fantastic discussion. One final bit of advice, this time from Edward Deming, the man who did so much to help Japan's economic growth after the Second World War. He said, profit in business comes from repeat customers, customers that boast about your project or service and that bring friends with them too. May I wish you a highly successful and profitable business day. Over the past few minutes, you've been part of any business questions. Now carry on the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag, or one word, any business questions. Or join us on the community. Just go to Google Plus and type in any business questions. If you'd like us to come to your event too, have a look at the business TV section on the ShoutPow website. That's shoutpow.com, the business TV section. We all hope to see you at the next event.